Next, we have Harry Murray. He's a professor at uh, Nazareth College, but we know him as a long time uh, activist and fighter for justice, uh, social justice, and world peace. And um, I think Harry has some comments regarding um, the remarks that the President of the United States made last night in his televised address, and he may address it any other areas as well. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Yes, my name's Harry Murray, and I'm a professor of sociology at Nazareth College and director of the Peace and Justice program there. And I'd like to just share some reflections on President Trump's speech last night um, announcing his expansion of the war in Afghanistan. Um, and probably expansion into Pakistan. Um, he began almost eloquently by calling for peace at home in conjunction with violence abroad. Um, it would have been his call for domestic and racial peace in the United States might have been almost convincing if it wasn't for his constant flip-flopping between calling for domestic peace and <clears throat> calling some white supremacists fine people. Mm -hmm. um, I agree that nobody is totally bad, but I'm not, not sure I would go quite that far. Um, I, I also call to mind that after Charlottesville, um, President Trump said that American children should not live in fear of violence. Do you remember that? But seemed to be forgetting that he himself, a few days earlier, had stoked that very fear in millions of American children by his threats of fire and fury against North Korea, calling back the kind of nuclear terror that um, many of us in my generation at this table uh, grew up under that threat of the, the mushroom cloud and I don't I know I don't want my children and grandchildren to live under that same fear um, he invoked a very simplistic narrative reminiscent of George W. Bush that says that the United States is fighting for good against evil um, and that the solution is to kill all terrorists, as if there are a certain number of people who are terrorists, and if we just kill them all, everything will be fine, ignoring the social and economic and political roots uh, that drive people into adopting terrorism. Um, what may be most disturbing is that his storyline is just an intensification of the same storyline that we've been hearing from presidents for decades, both Republican and Democrat, a storyline which attempts to hide American aggression and, if I can use the word imperialism, behind a rhetoric of altruism and self-sacrifice. He's proposing to intensify the war in Afghanistan, as he said, the longest war in American history, depending on how you define it, Afghanistan, long known as the graveyard of empires, and actually um, consigning the American empire to the graveyard, at least the <laughs> empire part, would be something I wouldn't oppose. Um, we've called untold suffering in Afghanistan uh, by our invasion and its aftermath. And perhaps most frighteningly, he's talking about expanding the war again into Pakistan. Um, from this tone of it, uh, issuing this as a challenge against the Pakistani government, making demands. Um, we have been bombing the tribal areas of Pakistan, primarily with drones, since 2004, with those drone strikes peaking in 2010 and declining steadily over since. The Bureau for Investigative Journalism reports only four drone strikes thus far in 2017, but presumably those will be increasing with tremendous dangers um, 
for expanding the war, his couple of lines about um, engaging India, Pakistan's um, traditional enemy since, since the independence of it, India and Pakistan in this conflict, also um, presents frightening possibilities of expanding the war. Um, but mostly I want to reflect on the fact that his entire speech and the framework for his speech ignores history. He said, and I quote, we cannot remain a force for peace in the world if we are not at peace with each other. I agree that we need to be at peace with each other if we are to be a force with the peace, a force for peace in the world, but we cannot be a force for peace in the world if we continue to be, as Martin Luther King told us a half century ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today. Uh, the United States, if you look at it objectively and historically, has not been a force for peace in the world. Since 1890, going back well over a century, we have sent troops into or bombed other countries 100, at least 105 times. On average, every 15 months, there has rarely been a year in the last 120 years when the United States troops have not been actively fighting a war in another country. Since 1890, excluding World War I and World War II, we have overthrown at least 15 foreign governments. Hawaii in 1893, Cuba in 1898, Puerto Rico in 1898, the Philippines in 1898, all as a result of the Spanish-American War, Panama in 1903, Nicaragua in 1909, Honduras in 1911, Iran in 1953, Guatemala in 1954, Vietnam in 1963, Chile in 1972, Grenada in 1983, Panama again in 1989, Afghanistan in 2001, Iraq in 2003. Those of you who are students of history may recognize that um, these invasions have not created long-term peace. Many, <coughs> many of these countries that we invaded decades or a century ago are still troubled as a result of our invasion. The United States military budget accounts for over a third, 37% of the world's military budget. Until a few years ago, it actually accounted for half, but China has been increasing its military spending. Um, we still spend about three times as much on the military as China. Um, the US military budget also accounts for more than half, 54%, of the federal discretionary budget. If one includes spending on veterans, the total comes to over 60%. When I said earlier or, that the US had an imperialist policy, um, I, I follow in many ways the, work, the writings of the political scientist Chalmers Johnson, who talks about the United States as having an empire of military bases. Military bases spread through roughly half the countries in the world, depending on what you count as, as a military base. Um, the very US military forces are structured for global control. The United States military is divided into six geographic commands. NORTHCOM, which controls North America. SOUTHCOM, which controls South America. PACCOM, controlling Asia and the Pacific, <coughs> CENTCOM, controlling the Middle East, EUROCOM, controlling Europe, and most recently, AFRICOM, controlling Africa. If the United States were a peaceful country without imperial ambitions, why would our, the basic structure of our military be to divide the entire globe up into regions with, with US military forces designated to control each of those. Um, 
I am, as, as some folks know, an, an advocate of, of Christian nonviolence. Fifty years ago, Martin Luther King said, the choice is no longer between nonviolence and violence. The choice is between nonviolence and non-existence. He said that in the context of Vietnam and the nuclear arms race with the Soviet Union. But as we look at the wars that the United States is fighting currently, and the renewal of the nuclear threat, particularly in the Trump administration, I would say that, that Martin Luther King's words are truer than ever. Thank you. Thank you.